Welcome to Using AstroPy for Astronomy in Python. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course was built in conjunction with an astrophysics student named Giuliano, so although you'll only hear my voice, the material was a joint effort. This course is a little different from your usual real Python single topic course. Here, the focus is on two problems in the astronomy space. That doesn't mean you should only take it if you're a stargazer. There are plenty of opportunities to learn some Python. But the approach is from a problem domain perspective rather than from the tool domains. There are several third-party libraries available in Python for doing astronomical calculations. This course uses AstroPy. If you're new to astronomy, don't worry. I'll cover both the concepts and how AstroPy represents them. Doing science often requires dealing with lots of data and as such, learning data management can be a real help. Although this isn't a pandas course per se, I'll be covering how you use pandas for the problems covered here, and you don't need to know any pandas before I get started. And same goes for matplotlib, which is probably the most popular Python library out there for graphing data. AstroPy can be a little noisy at times, so along the way, I'll also show you how to use Python's built-in warning module to suppress warnings. The code in this course was tested with Python 3.12. You can get away with an earlier version, but I do use the zone info module, which was added in Python 3.9, so you'll probably want to use at least that. Besides that, I used AstroPy 6.1.1, Matplotlib 3.9, NumPy 1.26.4, Pandas 2.2.2, .2 and Tabulate 0.9.0. .0. You don't have to be an amateur astronomer to enjoy the beauty of the night sky. Granted, I live in Toronto, a city of almost 3 million people, with a surrounding area having another 7. Oftentimes, the brightest light in my night sky is a helicopter, but travel a few hours north and you hit the wilderness, and the sky just blooms stars. Astronomy is a very accessible science. Anyone can look up and enjoy. But on top of that, most of the major institutions that do work in this space make their data publicly available. As such, with a little bit of work or the right app, you can learn a lot about what you're looking at. Python is the preeminent language for doing stuff quickly, and a lot of science work uses it. In fact, there are several third-party libraries that can help you do things like better plan your viewing, or just better understand how the stars move in the sky. This course is a Python course with a flavor of astronomy. You'll learn a bit about stellar coordinate systems and write some code to determine when there are planetary conjunctions and when best to view any given stellar body from your backyard. Unfortunately, I can't help you with the helicopters, but I bet if you googled around you could find a Python library that would. Next up, I'll start by working out the motions of the planets and when they line up in the sky. In the previous lesson, I gave you an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll be staying within our solar system and looking for planetary conjunctions. A planetary conjunction is when two or more of them line up in the sky. This happens when the viewing angle between them is small. Consider a star with three planets around it. These two planets aren't in conjunction, as their angle of separation is wide. But the first and third planets are, as the angle of separation is narrow. You could argue that true conjunction would be an angle of separation of zero, but to keep the computation low, I'm going to use a slightly larger value than that. How do you find planetary conjunctions? Well, looping through every planet and comparing it to every other planet for any given day and then doing it for a lot of days is computationally expensive. To reduce the amount of computing to be done, you can take advantage of the fact that Mercury is a speedy little guy. In fact, that's why it's called Mercury. The Romans named it after their fleet-footed, winged, actually, messenger god. Mercury, the planet, not the god, has an orbital period of 88 days. Calculating angular separation is done between two bodies, which means each calculation needs a reference and a target. Using Mercury as a reference point against all the planets is helpful. Those planets further out have slower angular velocities because their orbital distance is so much larger. If two of the further out planets are in conjunction, then in all likelihood they still will be the next time Mercury swings around. This isn't perfect, but for our purposes it gets us some answers and means far less calculation. 
To calculate the angular separation between two bodies in the sky, you need to know where they are. There are actually several different coordinate systems that astronomers use. In this lesson, I'll be using right ascension and declination. This is kind of like longitude and latitude, but using angles from the equator. And just how do you get the coordinates of an object in the sky? Or calculate their angular separation? Well, there's a library for that. AstroPy is a third-party library containing all sorts of tools for astronomy. It includes a database of stars and planetary bodies, and has an entire module dedicated to coordinate systems. The sky chord object contains the right ascension and declination of an object. Since AstroPy is a third-party library, that means you need to install it using pip. As always, don't forget to use a virtual environment. Our conjunction script will use Mercury as the reference point, and then for any given day, compare the angle of separation between Mercury and each of the other planets. To get the angle of separation, you need the sky chords of the two objects being compared. You can get the sky chord of a planet using the getBody function, which takes the name of a planet, a position, and a date and time. The position information requires your longitude, latitude, and elevation. I'll be using mine in Toronto for the examples, but you can either Google your city or use latlong.net in order to figure it out. Unfortunately, the date time needed by GetBody isn't a Python date time, it's an AstroPy time object. To loop through a series of dates, I'm going to use Python's date and time delta features. This introduces a problem. The AstroPy time object doesn't take a Python date time object as an initializer. It will take an ISO formatted date string, though. So you can do something a little hacky. Convert the Python date time into a string, and then use that to create an AstroPy time object. Fun, huh? Once you've got sky coordinates for objects, you can use AstroPy's angular separation function to determine their angle of separation. Oddly, this function doesn't actually take sky coordinate objects, which you'd think would be the natural thing for it to do, but it does use the right ascension and declination of the bodies being compared. Seeing as those are inside the sky coordinate object, you just have to reference the attributes in order to pass them into the function. In the course overview, I commented about AstroPy being a little chatty warning-wise. AstroPy uses a dataset called IERS to deal with times and positions. This is to account for things like leap seconds. If you go too far into the future or past, AstroPy will issue a warning. If you are outside of the IERS range, it falls back to an approximation calculation. As I'm going to be calling functions that will trigger this warning a lot, I'm going to show you how to suppress that warning using Python's built-in warning module. The script I'm building is going to calculate the angle of separation between Mercury and six other planets. That's six because you can't do the angular separation between Mercury and Earth because Earth isn't in Earth's sky. And the other one, well, Pluto is Mickey's dog. It's not a planet, at least not until the IAU changes its mind again. I'll be doing this comparison calculation a bunch of times, so I'm going to have a table of data where each row is a day containing the six angular separations, and each column is the angular separation of a specific planet from Mercury. When dealing with tabular data, Pandas is probably the go-to library. It has a concept of rows and columns, which it stores in an object known as a data frame. You can access rows, columns, cells, or groups of cells in a data frame, as well as do operations on entire rows or entire columns. The coding style of Pandas, and in fact most libraries like it, can take a little getting used to. For example, you can do math on all the things in a column in a single line of code, and so it can sometimes be hard to remember when you're dealing with more than one piece of data at a time or dealing with something singular. At least I find it a little hard. And just how do you construct a data frame? Well, you can create the objects by hand, which is what I'm going to be doing in this lesson, or you can read in a CSV file, which is handy. The library is very spreadsheet-like, so by reading in a CSV, you can actually export from an actual spreadsheet and import it into your program. Each row in the data frame has an index. 
This can be a auto-generated value, like a counter, or you can set it explicitly. When dealing with data that has a date or timestamp, it's common practice to make that the index value. This is called time series data. A great reason for doing this is Pandas has tools that allow you to interpolate between rows when the index is a date or time. There are several different ways of getting at rows and columns in a data frame, and the dot lock attribute allows you to use square bracket notation to get at part of the data by referencing the index or the name of the column. Note this isn't like a list. The index in this case may not be a counter. It could be that date or time, which is the timestamp that I was talking about. To go along with the dot lock attribute is the dot i lock attribute, which does use Python style indexing. So if you want to slice using a index number like you're used to in your code, you do that with i lock instead. Using dot lock and i lock can get a little complicated because they both allow you to write filters as well that would show a subset of the data or operate on a subset of the data. I will be writing a few of these in the course. I'll do my best to explain them, but feel free to treat them like black magic. If you want to learn the spell, there are pandas specific courses that I'll point you at later on. Okay, so back to my table filled with angular separations. I'm going to have a row for each date and columns for the angular separations between Mercury and each of the six planets. I then want to determine if there is a conjunction. I can do that by counting how many columns in a row contain values that are small enough to consider them conjunctions. I'm going to do this using one of those tricky little black magic bits that I just talked about. Pandas are very tricky. It's probably why they wear masks. So, the iLock attribute on a data frame allows you to access a row and or column using Python's numeric slicing format. The code here is looking at the first row, that's the zero, and a slice of the columns, skipping the first column. My first column will have the date in it, and that shouldn't be included in our calculation about conjunctions. To find how many conjunctions there are, I use the LE method, which stands for less than or equal. The return from this call is a new set of data with a boolean for each planet whose angular separation is less than 7. 7 degrees is a bit wide for a conjunction, but it's small enough to keep the calculations, in our case, quick. The output of the LE call is a group of booleans, one for each planet. True indicates the angular separation is below 7, and false means it isn't. Then I'm going to double down on this trickiness and use the return from that and call sum. When you sum booleans, they get cast to integers, one for true, zero for false. So summing booleans is equivalent to counting the true values. When you chain the sum call to the LE call, you get a count of conjunctions that are less or equal to 7. In both of these calls, I'm going to use the access argument. The access argument works in a whole bunch of pandas calls and changes the behavior of the function based on whether to operate on rows or columns. So the LE is being done across the columns, and the sum is being done across the rows. You want these in place to make sure you aren't summing the column itself, but summing across the columns. Look, I know these two lines are messy, and if you've never done any pandas before, they're a lot to absorb at once. If you're not quite absorbing it, don't worry. This is a fairly advanced bit of pandas, and if you're interested, it will make a lot more sense if you go take an intro course. If you're not interested, guess what? This is the equivalent of Googling and copying and pasting. Pandas is a third-party library, which means you'll need to pip install it. Unlike with all third-party libraries, you should use a virtual environment when you do so. Once you've got your data frame filled with information, you're going to want to print it out to screen. If you call print on a Pandas data frame, it shows you some of the data, but the results can be a bit chunky. How does something that only eats bamboo get so roly-poly? Great, now I'm fat shaming a bear. Anyhow, Pandas does allow for formatting of a data frame using styler objects, but these only work within a Jupyter notebook. They won't apply in the terminal. Enter the tabulate third-party library. It builds tables for your terminal. It supports more than just pandas, so if you need to print out tables, it's a useful tool all around. Sing it along with me. Tabulate is a third-party library, so with it you need to pip install. Don't forget to use a virtual environment. 
I'll use tabulate to show off our planetary information and look for some conjunctions. All right, let's actually look at some code now. Using my crystal ball, I'm looking into the future. I can see that I'm going to need some constants that I want to use again. And as such, I've created a shared configuration file called conf.py. There's some stuff in here you're not going to use until the next lesson, so I'll be ignoring some of it for now. The astropy get body call fetches coordinate information about an object in our solar system, and it needs to know where on Earth you are as positioning information is relative to you. More on this in a future lesson. But for now, you need to know that you need an Earth location object, so I'm importing that here. When dealing with astronomical data, in fact, most science data, you're going to have both values and units that go with them. To help track and manage this, AstroPy has a module that allows you to attach unit information to your data. Here, I'm importing it and aliasing it to you. This allows you to do things like translate between degrees and radians, and helps prevent you from sending in one when a function expects the other. To create an Earth location object, you need some positional information. I've created three constants here, one for latitude, one for longitude, and one for elevation. The magic numbers are my home in Toronto, Canada. Using these three constants, I create a new Earth location object. Note how I multiply latitude and longitude by degrees and elevation by meters, making sure the correct unit information is associated with the values. Everything else in this file is actually for the next lesson. So let's go look at the conjunction code.